Mealy Kerr, welcome to my podcast. Dom, thanks for having me. It's thanks. good to be here. Uh, mate, we've been trying to... I, I went back through my DMs on Instagram. We've been bouncing backwards and forwards for the best part of a year, trying to figure figure out how to do this. And I know, it's been, it's been a... It's been a bit of a mission to get this this podcast going, but finally, finally, it's, and in the mount of uh, all places, it's wonderful. So you were here for a training camp at the moment with the New Zealand team, yeah, right. yeah, here here till Tuesday, Tuesday night. Um, yeah, we go to South Africa soon, so training camp with everyone, which be, which has been nice. You are all over the place. I, I was in the UK last month. I did a podcast there with uh, your friend Susie Bates, who you told me just off mic before is maybe the best New Zealand cricketer of all time. Yeah, she goes down as probably the goat um, in New Zealand women's cricket. So yeah, her record's outstanding and she's she's seen in New Zealand as um, one of the best cricketers we've ever had. Amazing. So I've got Susie Bates. Now I've got you, Mealy Kerr. I know. What a downgrade. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that at all. And there's um, there's so much to um, discuss with you because you're such an intriguing person. There's the cricket and then there's the, the whole other stuff as well because um, you've just been very uh, yeah, open and vulnerable and transparent about your mental health struggles. So first of all, um, how are you today? You good? You bad? You neutral? Yeah, I'm good actually. Um Going good. You know, it comes in waves and, and mm. whatnot, and I think, you know, it's been awesome to kind of create that Treading Water series and speak about my story and share other people's stories. Um, I kind of thought, like, after that, you've spoken about, I guess, your worst times, and then people assume you're all good. But I just wanted to be honest and open about how I was feeling, um, and it's not that I'm all good now. Well, I'm in a great place now, but, you know, there's still bad days. There's still times where I kind of do struggle, um, but I guess that's human, and, and mm. that's kind of part of it. Like, depression, it doesn't necessarily just go away. You kind of learn strategies and coping, mechanism, co- coping mechanisms, and, um, yeah, but I think since my experiences, I've just appreciate life so much more. I have a better understanding of myself. So not that I ever want to feel that way again. I'm grateful um, that I have been through what I've been through and had that support network around me. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that later on in the podcast and um, and as much or as little detail as, as what you want. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can relate to a, a lot of it. And I was thinking about it on the drive down today. And actually, this is something I got from um, the podcast I did with um, another good friend of yours, uh, Sophie Devine. Um, with my own mental health struggles, like I think it's given me so much. Like It's made me a more empathetic person. Mm. Um, it's made me more understanding of other people. So even though it's, it's fucking shit to go through that stuff, um, there are like pluses that you can see from it, right? Yeah, definitely. Like It's... Cruel, like depression's cruel, mm. um, but it does give you perspective when you kind of come out the other side and you do learn a lot. I've always been a real empath, em- empath, so uh, ever since I was young. So I've always kind of taken on or felt other people's emotions and been quite sensitive growing up. But yeah, it definitely, it definitely does, uh, it does help you. It's kind of what they say, you know, it makes you stronger. I guess mm. um, it's like any setback, it's. You know how you can move forward from that. Yeah, it's funny though. I like how how it just doesn't discriminate. Like your your sister, who you're very close with, and she's in the Mount, Mount Monganu with you at the moment. So she had um, a condition called Bell's palsy when she was young. She's uh, got diagnosed with diabetes as well. <laughs> so on paper, you'd think she's the one that should have you know yeah. mental health issues. Yeah, but I it's mean, just not how it works. No, nah, it's not how it works, and it's crazy how powerful your brain is. Um, it's ridiculous and. It doesn't discriminate, and I think that's the thing. Like I always say, just be kind to people because people have stories, and you have no idea what's going on in their life or in their head. And you know, if you can just be kind, because you don't know what mm. could set someone off. Yeah, yeah. Ten ten years ago, if um if someone said to me, "What do you want to be?" Uh, or if someone told me I was kind, I'd, I'd like bristle at, at the word. I fucking hated it. <laughs> I didn't didn't I didn't want to be seen as being like kind. I just wanted to be like a savage or funny yeah. or something. Um, now I'd take it as the the biggest compliment. 
Like, so I, I agree. Uh, you never know what what like what what path the pe- people are on or what journey people are going through. So, I think a little kindness goes a long way, eh? Yeah, yeah. it's always time for the the savage joke with your close <laughs> mates, isn't there? But yeah, hundred yeah. percent. kind, you know, if you're kind, you can give that joke yeah. to your mates. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, we'll we'll um we'll park that to one side for a, a second, and we'll get back to some. We'll, we'll do some fun stuff, and then we'll get back to that later on. So, first of all, um. Go back to um, a very very young Mealy Kerr. What, what what are your what are your earliest memories? Yeah, um, my childhood. I it's funny. I think I had like I loved my childhood. It was just we were outside all the time, playing sport, big family. Um, so kind of like my cousins. Some of my cousins lived with, uh, with with us growing up. And my uncle and auntie, and so there's always a full house. Um, and yeah, just really active and lots of friends, lots of family. So love growing up. I yeah, I was always quite a chilled out kid as well and always looked out for other people as well. And I think a lot of that I reckon stemmed from when I was young, my mum had breast cancer and I used to go every day um, to the hospital with her when she was going through chemo. So how old were you, like three? Yeah, Three-ish? yeah, yeah. about three. Um, what do you? What, can you remember much about that? That's very young. Did you know what was going on, or were you just nah, traipsing around with your mum? No idea, yeah. really, um, what was going on. But I think speaking to people and from things, there's probably like, I think that's where my empathy came from as well, seeing my mum. My mum my wrote letters, I guess, throughout that time, and um, she always, well, apparently I always said, oh, when I started school, even at five or yeah five years old, I said, "Oh, my mum's still sick because she's got short hair." So I just assume short hair means you're sick. Um, but oh, that's so cute. <laughs> and then, like, yeah, Jess. Growing up, Jess was quite independent. Like, so what's the age gap with you two? Two and three years, almost three years. Okay. Um, but yeah, like I remember Jess's first day of school. She was sweet as like get me in there I remember my first day of school I'm looking out the windows my mum's leaving like crying and just and I think I just didn't want to leave my mum's side and I think part of that too is because like a nurturing thing yeah it was like yeah every day I kind of saw her sick growing up and um but yeah I love my childhood um but I was always really sensitive and aware of struggles around us um what like I think just everyday type of struggles, but um, I guess Jess, growing up, it was like she did running and she was so passionate about it and and really good at it. But, you know, she had Bow's palsy when she was young. Um, Yes, what what does that mean exactly? So half her face is paralysed. So it's basically like a mini stroke in her face and, you know, she couldn't drink out of a cup. She needed a straw. She like couldn't close her eye um, for a while. She's sleeping a little eye patch, and um, yeah, so she had that, and then she had type one diabetes. Um, you know, my mum had cancer, and then it came back again when I was about eighteen. And then my dad lost his parents um, within about six months of each other. Um, and then my auntie, my auntie got quite sick. Um, and with and mental health problems and was an alcoholic. Um, so, um, yeah, there was all of that happening. And I was young, but I seemed to observe a lot and and notice notice those things. Um, and, you know, I just carried on doing what I love, playing sport with my friends. But I was always quite hyper aware. Mm. Um, and then I went kind of went to college and suicide seemed to be a common common theme around me like my my boyfriend at college his dad had committed suicide wow. not while we were together but um I was kind of one of the first pers- people he opened up to about that and he actually only found out at a young age and then I had a boy in my class um who were in the same class for five years wasn't my best mate or anything but um, he had committed suicide as well in year 13 and that, it was just, it felt like it became a normal word mm. in my world and then um, in 2020, my best, one of my best mates, Dan Fui, who was on Treading Water, um, which was extremely brave of him to want to be a part of it, his 
younger brother had committed suicide and yeah, it just became normal and I think because I'm such a deep thinker and I'm an empath, it just, I just wasn't, I just was in this world and mm. I just think I saw a lot happening around me. Mm. It's funny, yeah, because I suppose you could, there's two ways of sort of looking at it when you're exposed to, I suppose, that much um, suicide, like on... Uh, on, the, on the one perspective, you could go, okay, well, you know, this this is a it's it's a way out, and it's a it's it's an option that we've all got open to us that mm. we can explore if things get really bad. But then on the flip side of that, you can go, um, like you realise, um, for the for the person that's taking their own life, their pain stops, but but it doesn't go away; it gets transferred to everyone, everyone around else. them. Yeah. Like the the ripple effect of anyone, you know, people mm. that obviously feel there's the world's going to be a better place without them. But the the impact it leaves and the hole it leaves, it's just the magnitude's massive, eh? Yeah, it's even the whole community. Yeah, like, yeah. It's even the people that don't know the person. It just affects a community. Mm. Um, and, yeah, it's it's so sad. Like, it's... Oh, it is. It's, it's one of the saddest things imaginable. Yeah. So that's, um, so that's young Amelia Kerr. And then... Um, so cricket was all, cricket was always part of your life, eh? Yes. So your parents, but were both pretty yeah, good cricketers. Yeah, yeah. So both my parents played for Wellington. Yeah. Dad played indoor cricket for New Zealand. He captained them, and then my papa played for the Black Caps. Um, and yeah, that's right. On yeah. on your mum's side. Yeah. 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 So our mum's my mum's side big, big like all the cousins are close, and we just grew up in the backyard. I played. With uh, my cousins and and then mates, so I played boys cricket growing up till I was eighteen. Um, so yeah. Oh, like in boys teams. Yeah, yeah, and loved it. Yeah, as I, said, I mean, she she's um, quite a bit older than you, but um, another girl from Tower, Sophie Devine, had her on the podcast, and yeah, she had the same sort of experience. Did you? Um, yeah, what sort of negativity or backlash uh, can you recall from that? Like playing boys teams, like was there anything like? Uh, I had um, I had none. Mm. I think because I'd played boys cricket since I was five years old through to eighteen, you kind of played the same guys throughout. So it's almost just like you were you were one of them. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I captained uh, the boys teams I played in when we got older as well. So yeah, it was just normal. It was it was my normal. And it was actually the normal as well. It was more when we like went up north to Hastings cricket camp and you'd play teams, boys teams that had never played against a girl and they were like, this is weird and they <laughs> try sled you and whatnot. Yeah, and, at what age? Yeah, about 12. <laughs> what's, what's yeah, sl- what? it was can, you, can you recall terrible. what sort of sledging they're coming it's, out with at 12? It's not good sledging. It's like, <laughs> mate, grow up. <laughs> so you just ah. Uh, <laughs> You're hopeless, <laughs> but no, it was, it was good fun. So yeah, big family, big group of family friends, really close, still close with them all today. Yeah, um, yeah, active, active lifestyle. And then, is, did you show like sort of promise or talent as a young player? Or uh, I think so. Yeah, I, yeah, I. So I played, I played a lot of sports growing up, um, cricket, football. Athletics in cross country and then like intermediate, played a little bit of basketball and rugby sevens and and whatnot. But cricket was kind of always the passion and what I wanted to do. But it wasn't until I had watched the White Ferns play on TV and I was like, that's what I want to be. And that was about at nine years old. And then I remember um, I wasn't scoring heaps of runs on Saturdays and I'm I'm a p- perfectionist and I I. Yeah, so that's also a little bit of probably like mental health stuff is I had to be a certain way for everyone else. I had to be perfect. Everything I had to do do had to be perfect for everyone around me. Everyone expected me to be this certain way. But to a degree, it has helped my training. Um, Fuck, I'm I'm the same. It's fucking exhausting, eh? It can get tiring. But in some ways, I think, well, it's a a superpower in a way. Yeah, it can help you. But it's exhausting. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> are you like that with everything, or is it you keep, like can you? I know you've got into, and yeah, we'll get into your resilience plan and your mental health strategy. But I'm, I've read you're into photography now and playing the guitar. Can you do things just for fun and not have to be good at them? I can do things for fun and and <laughs> not have to be good at them. But 
<laughs> if I'm like if I'm gonna do something, I want to do it well. <laughs> so, but I know I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna be the best at everything. But like if we're doing something and it's a challenge, I want to win. So, so <laughs> well, you're a punish. <laughs> so there's 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 somewhat there's somewhat of I can just go in and out and enjoy myself. But I do like doing things well. Um, but yeah, well, I remember when I was young, I wasn't scoring runs. Um, on a, on a Saturday, and I was like to my dad, like, "Why, why am I not scoring runs? I'm not that good." And then I kind, I think it came from my parents. Like they both work really hard, and I thought, if you want to be good at anything in life, you have to work hard for mm. it. So then I saw that game when I was nine, watching the White Ferns, and was like, "Right, I need to go to the nets before school, and team trainings aren't enough." So a bit at, at about nine or ten. Dad and I would go to the local nets uh, before primary school started and I'd bet with him and pretend I was a white fern batting with Sophie and Susie and then I'd bowl pretending I was bowling at, you know, the Aussie women's team that I play against now. I've got goosebumps <laughs> hearing the story. Like, you're, you're friends and teammates with them now. Yeah, you know, the fact it's that, ridiculous. That they're that, that age and they're still playing and they had an impact on you as a nine-year-old girl. Yeah. It's bonkers. It is. And it's funny, like, I remember... Um, with dad would like do a scenario and play play like it was a game and I'd get him to commentate and then like if I got a 50 I'd raise my bat but as soon as cars drove past or if there was someone out someone else in the nets I'd walk up to dad and be like don't commentate (laughs) (laughs) your poor dad I know I was like we gotta be quiet while there's other people here not raising my bat today but I just visualised like I was batting in front of a full crowd you know (laughs) it was funny funny. man well how um, I'm I'm just curious So, so you're 22 now yeah so so it was 13 years ago that you were nine and you were watching the White Ferns. How, how were you watching the White Ferns on TV? Was it even televised? It was like there was one game that right. was televised that I watched. Right. Um, and I'd been to a couple of home matches. Mm. So I'd seen a handful yeah, okay. of games. But I knew the players because um, I'd watched the Wellington Blaze play as well. So they'd played like, you know, I'd see Sophie play and then they'd play Otago, see Susie play. But yeah. That's, I guess, how I knew. But it was there was one game on TV that I remember vividly. It's so cool that you've um, you've got these memories and uh, these role models that are that are now your friends. Because it's, I mean, it, it would have been just as easy, or even uh, easier, for your role models to be like I don't know, like Martin Guptill or Kane Williamson or you know whoever was big in the men's game at the time. Yeah, like there was the definitely men's players too. I looked up to, but yeah, I, I was fortunate that I got those one or two games I watched on TV to have those role models, um, which now, you know, it's televised more, so you can Mm. have those role models. But I probably only got to watch because I come from a cricketing family and my dad would have known that they were playing on TV otherwise. Yeah. You know, you'd have no idea. Yeah, so, I mean, if you're around long enough, there's every likelihood that there's going to be some nine-year-old kid now that's at the nets with her dad, Dad commentated, yeah, maybe? Maybe, maybe <laughs> Being <not>. you. <laughs> yeah, and that's the cool thing, and I think that's now, like, when you're signing kids' stuff after games and whatnot, it's taking the time. Um, but also, when you chat to them, and they tell you they love cricket and whatnot, you say, oh, I'll be playing with you in five, ten years' time, and their face just, like, <laughs> lights up. Yeah. But that's, you know, that mm. well, I was at the Nets and saw Sophie and Susie, and they said that that's what happened to me as a dream come true. Mm. That's amazing. And then and then you um, you play rep cricket for Wellington when you're what like thirteen, fourteen? Yeah, fourteen, fourteen. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I looked pretty small then. That is that is nuts. So so it's what was the average age of the team? They all oh. women. Yeah, yeah. I was the youngest by a wee while. Um, yeah, probably range from fourteen to thirty odd. Right. So who, so who do you talk to in the team? Or do, they, do, they, do they all feel like aunties? Or? Um, I was so shy, <laughs> so nervous. Not nervous to play, but nervous to be around people that, what am I going to talk to them about? So I, well, they, I think, I think yeah. that's a very reasonable fear as well. Yeah. Like, what have you got in common? Absolutely nothing, yeah. apart from cricket. Yeah, so I actually found probably that first year quite hard. I love the on-field stuff. Um, the on-field stuff was awesome 
because I just wanted to play cricket and, and loved it. But yeah, it was hard because I just felt like I was nervous and shy. I had a really nice roommate, um, Alex Evans, who doesn't play anymore, but she was older, um, an older one in the team, and she just took like took me in, looked after me. Like I was a kid, so. How old was she at the time? Uh, she would have been... Like 20s? Yeah, mid-late yeah. 20s. So, And she just took me in and looked after me. Mm. And, yeah, I always remembered that as I kind of thought that's what I want to be like when I'm older and young. there's a young girl coming into the team because it's scary. Yeah. But you weren't, you weren't scared or anxious or nervous about the on-field stuff. You were fine with that? Yeah, fine with that. I, Isn't that funny? Yeah. I um. There's a there's a saying that um youth is wasted on the young. Yeah. And it's like you just have no sort of fear, do you? No fear, but I think even now, like, I don't really get nervous at all playing cricket. Um, you know, there's moments where you get a little bit nervous, but I've always been very calm, and I just love it so much. And I think because I love it, that you know, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing. So I'm just playing the game I love, and if I prepare well. I trust that. So I've never really gotten nervous and it's just about going out and enjoying myself. But, yeah, there's definitely moments that you do get nervous too. Mm. And, and so that age, when you're, when you're 14 and you're playing in the, uh, the Wellington rep team, if you have a, like a bad innings, and I don't know if you ever got a duck or anything, but how did you cope with that emotionally? You sort of, Su- Susie yeah. Bates told me a story like she'd, she'd go to the toilets and have a little cry yeah, afterwards. she still and does that. Oh, does she? On a bad, bad day. It's very rare now. It's very rare. She won't let me say that. Um, I have been very lucky with the family I've grown up, at, up in and like sport is amazing. It teaches you so many lessons, I think. Um, but I think I've learned a lot of that through my family and I remember when I was young, my dad said to me, if I turn up to the ground and you're walking off the field and I haven't watched a single ball, I don't want to know if you've got a duck or a hundred. So that's kind of been my thing. Like, if I get out, yes, I wish I'm still batting and whatnot, but I can't change it. So that's kind of my thing. Like, if I can keep my body body language good, go back, sit back with the team, and then pro- I'll process it later um, and whatnot. But, yeah, I've, I think that was a great message from my dad that, it was like, yeah, duck or 100, I don't want to know. And I think with cricket being such a fickle game, like if you get too high on the good stuff and too low on the bad stuff, it's going to be a bloody tough sport because, yeah, yeah. you know, there's so many variables. Yeah, and you're going to ride the highs and lows, aren't you? Yeah, I've a, I think like through my career I've been quite lucky in that I think that messaging, but I've been very level throughout my cricketing mm. career. And it's a little bit like, perspective I think like at the end of the day it is just a game but I get you put so much work into it like when it when it doesn't come off it it's tough when the team loses it's tough but it is trying to be as level as possible Mm. and um but yeah I think there's tough moments and you know world cups have been tough I think for our group and that's probably where the lows hit uh, most of the time is we've underperformed and as a team and that's that's been tough but yeah, I think staying level in sport. Mm. But again, like the um, where things are at now, especially with all these like sort of short, short stint competitions that you do. Like you've just recently been in the UK for this one. What's it called? The one hundred. Yeah, because yeah. it's a hundred balls. Yeah, hundred yeah. balls. So you get paid a lot of money to be part of this franchise for a very short tournament. Um, <laughs> do you feel guilty if you don't pl- play well? It's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. Yeah, I guess that's like some somewhat in the. You do want to play well. It's like they have picked me and they're paying me to perform. So, but I guess also it's like in, it's the sport, though, isn't it's it? It's the sport and it's a job. Like, you know, if you're bad at your job, you could get fired. And it's the same for us. Mm. Um, the only thing is with sport, like the margins and the you can see it right in front of you, the numbers are right there. Mm. So, you know, when you've had a bad day, you know, when you've had a good day. But yeah, there's yeah. no hiding, is there? There's, yeah, there's no hiding. But I guess, like, for me, every time I play batting, bowling, fielding, I just want to contribute. I want to do the best I can in all three. And that's that's the thing. And I think I'm lucky, too, as an all-rounder. Um, 
that you know if I fail batting, I can still make a difference for the team with my bowling or in mm. the or in the field. Um, and then the things that people don't see is the impact you can have off the field, um, which in those leagues I think is extremely valuable when you're bringing people in, when you're bringing leaders in from around the world. You can have a real impact on the group also. Yeah. And as so, you make the New Zealand team when you were sixteen. Yeah. Fuck! Can you remember that? I like, do. But like were you in? Was it a surprise, or were you sort of on the? You know, was there like quite a bit of heat around you at the time? Were you in the selectors, you know, like radar for, or frame of reference? Yeah, I think it was. A, well, it was a real surprise to me. Um, I had, I reckon, a year before that. So there was a World Cup. I made my debut in twenty sixteen, and then there was a. 50 over World Cup in England in 2017. And about the year before I made the White Ferns, I had a, had, I didn't have a coffee, but I had a coffee with my dad. And um, we spoke about the White Ferns and about that World Cup. And I was like, that would be cool to play in that. And dad was like, you probably won't make it. So you were f- 15 at <laughs> Yeah, 15. Time. Yeah. He's like, it'd be very unlikely for you to make it, but you might get picked like he was like, but you could if you go really well, you could get picked as the fifteenth player, and they take you for like, I oh, just to sort of bleed you, yeah, for the future tournament for the future, yeah, yeah. And then I made my debut for the White Fins in twenty sixteen, which did not think at all that was going to happen. Uh, played in played in that series against Pakistan at home, and then went to Aussie. We played Aussie, and then we played Aussie at home in a Rose Bowl, and I played all those games. Um, and then they had to pick the World Cup team, got in that, went to England and ended up playing every single game over there. So it was amazing how, like, two years before that, it was kind of like uh, there's a 10% chance you'll get picked as that 15th member in the squad to going to playing every game. And I just, yeah, I just, I got that opportunity when I was 16. And, yeah, I think, I, again, I had people that backed me. And that always helps. Like who? I guess well, my family, but the coach to pick me at 16 and play me. Mm. And the people in the team as well. Like I felt like they weren't like, oh, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> piss, <laughs> so, piss off, kid. Like they weren't <laughs> like, who's, who's yeah. my daughter on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're not babysitting. <laughs> so <laughs> take your TikTok yeah. somewhere else. <laughs> Yeah, I just wow. felt, you know when you um, might enter a job or mm. an environment and you feel like you have to prove yourself first, and I definitely have felt that in my career, but I felt I feel, like that I feel, me. I feel like anyone, anyone in a sort of team environment, uh, a high-performance team environment, probably has to do that every step of the way, right? Yeah, you feel you like you have to, have to prove, prove yourself. yourself. Yeah. But yeah, sometimes you can put too much pressure on yourself mm. and it doesn't get the best out of you. Some people it gets the best out of them, but... Yeah. Yeah, I just I was really backed, and Susie was captain at the time, and she just she trusted me because I, for a young cricket, I thought about the game. I loved it. I tactically thought about the game, um, so I was quite confident in knowing what I wanted to do and what type of player I was at that time. Um, and yeah, she just trusted me, and I loved training, so I competed hard. And when I was in the Nets too with the White Ferns. Like for me, I wanted to play, so I was like, "I've got to give everything in training. Like, you got to be again the best you can be to make sure you get on that park." Um, and it was kind of like, yeah, just the mentality I had probably from a young age to just not much phase me with not getting nervous and whatnot. And I just wanted to be out there. I I wanted to be that person in those moments. It was like me at the nets with my dad commentating and I'd go to school and would do creative writing and I'd talk about hitting the winning runs in a World Cup final and and all of that. It was just like I dreamt like, it. Yeah, it's almost like visualising it or yeah. manifesting it or something. Yeah, it is kind of like manifesting and, yeah, it is. Mm. Yeah, and visual. Visu- visu- wow, I can't speak. V- Visualisation. Yes, that's yeah. the word. Yeah, um, that's crazy. And, so, and it was around this time, so uh, I think when you were 17, you were playing... Um, Ireland, and you got yes. 232, 232 runs not out, 
which is fucking insane. <laughs> but I've seen video footage of that. It looks like it's on like a school field or something. Yeah, it was on a club ground. Right. Yes, so, there's houses in the back. Yeah, houses in the back. It's just that old Irish, Irish kind of kind of ground. It was a cool little ground, but yeah, it's amazing now where we're playing from where it, where it's come. But yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's it's remarkable. Yeah. Eh? It is. You, like, so that's like five years ago, and um, so it's such a short passage of time, but so much has changed. Yeah, ridiculous amounts. And yeah, like the footage I've seen looks like it's recorded on someone's handy cam yeah, or phone I think or something. It, I think it was. <laughs> so so what, what are your re- recollections of that? Was it just a, just a day or a game where just everything went right? You're in that flow state? Yeah. What happened? I think so. So I wasn't, it's like people are like, what are you thinking about? Well, I wasn't thinking. And I think that sometimes when you're in your best form as a batter in, in cricket, you just are so, your mind's so clear. Um, but yeah, I started my career as a bowler, but I always batted growing up and always have been pretty technically technically good and it was kind of a strength thing with batting. And um, yeah, I got the opportunity to open the batting that game and I hadn't batted much for New Zealand um, so I just wanted to kind of make the most of it and I'd been working really hard on my batting and yeah, just, you know, had a bit of luck along the way, but things just kind of fell into place and it was just playing, I guess, a strength, strength-based approach, playing my game, but not premeditating, not overthinking and yeah, it's, everyone asks about it and I don't really know what to say ever, but I think it was just I loved batting and I wasn't a batter at that point in my career. Mm. Um, and I wasn't after that either. But I just wanted to make the most of that opportunity. Yeah, 232 uh, not out. It's insane. It's crazy, eh? Yeah, I mean... Do you, look, a, you look back now, you're still in the in the early stages of your career, but you're an established player. Like, you, you look back now and what do you think? Like, you're a, ki- yeah. you're a kid, basically, eh? Yeah, I mean, I haven't thought about it. Too much, but yeah, when you think, when you, as you get older and you think about it, I was seventeen, mm. still in school, and <laughs> yeah, I, but it was yeah, crazy day really, and and, and you oh, and you, so the team went out to celebrate afterwards, and you you couldn't even go to the go to yeah, the we bar. all so they we all had a drink and <laughs> we all had, we all had a drink in the bar afterwards. Um, <laughs> what did you have, like a, like a raspberry yeah, and like, lemonade? Yeah, or? the classic raspberry and coke. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so the t- we had a team drink in the bar. I was allowed in the bar because someone could just say they're my parents. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it was nice. Like the team celebrated it. They had a drink for me, and then you know Love Island was on, so <laughs> had to get back for that because that was the show everyone was watching. Oh, was it? Was that the season with um, Tommy and Molly? <laughs> yeah, it probably was oh, actually. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Still going strong. Wow, and then did life change much after that? I mean, that, that's, I mean that's when you yeah. first came onto my radar because I, I read about it. But in, in reflection now, I, I mean, it, it would have been a 30 second piece on the news, mm. not the lead story. Yeah. Like if, if uh, Bowden Barrett had a hamstring injury, it would have been ahead of that in the sports news that night, probably. Yeah. And a yeah. Lot's, again, a lot's changed in Changing, the five years yeah. since then. But yeah, did much change for you? I guess, yeah. Well, nothing changed. But. You know, there was media interviews. I was annoyed because the like the next day, because I was a teenager as well, I was sleeping in <laughs> and tired after that day. And then the media manager was like, so breakfast TV, I want to talk to you. Can you get up at 6 a.m.? <laughs> and I was oh, <laughs> jeez. <laughs> so, yeah, there was, there was more, I guess, media around it. Um, even today, every now and then, you, you still get asked about it. So it definitely, you just get asked about it, and there was a lot of media at that time. But I didn't really see it or anything because I was over in Ireland, um, which I think was good just to not be there to, yeah. you know, to hear that hear that stuff. Um, and I don't go on social media too much ever and look at... Um, not getting what, high on your own yeah, supply. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, yeah, I mean, because yeah, it's a it's a double edged sword, isn't it? So if you if you if you're going to do that and then you got to read, read the, the good bad stuff, about, yeah, hundred yeah. percent, you got to take the good with the bad. Yeah, but no, it, it it didn't change anything. But I guess you know, to a degree, it gave me somewhat a little bit of confidence that I have a method that I can score runs. But at that time, you know, Ireland were a weaker weaker team in the world, and I wanted to be able to do, I wanted to be able to score runs against 
the big nations and the and, and the big countries and um so then almost after that it became quite tough because well, I wasn't an established batter at all. I had one good innings or one or two good innings and then I kind of got moved around the order. Um, you know, I'd bat six and then I'd fail and I'd be back down at nine and then three games later I'd be up at six again and I was just like, I need to score runs every time I bat to stay, to keep my spot mm. there. So I was getting picked as a bowler regardless, but for me I wanted to be picked as an all-rounder. And so then I was like, no one thinks I'm good enough, but I want to bat so badly. And it wasn't until I probably trusted my game and had um, – well, Bob Carter was amazing for my batting. And Who's he? He was the uh, last White Ferns coach, right. and he came in and he batted me three. And that's probably where I had, like, a breakout um, series against India. Right. And that just gave me a lot of confidence that I'm good enough to be in this position and I'm good enough to be in this role. And he gave – me a lot of confidence that you know he backed me he was like you're good enough to be here so I think that really helped um so it was almost like I had that score but then I still felt like I had to pr- keep proving myself every time I batted yeah it's funny that eh that's how it is it's not like yeah I'm done now this yeah. is it I'm set yeah every I suppose every time you go out there you got to keep proving something you got something to prove yeah. every fucking time yeah it's exhausting yeah, it but, can get it. But how good? Oh, and yeah. I am. Um, yeah, but you, you didn't. I'll bring it up since you haven't. In that game, you got five wickets as well. So yes. 232 runs not out and five wickets. I don't care how weak you say the Irish <laughs> team is, it's still a phenomenal game. Yeah, I mean, it's never going to happen for me again in my career. Um, but yeah, I was absolutely knackered after the batting innings. Uh, so I'm not, I don't hit sixes like Sophie. Um, so there's a bit more running going on in my innings. So I'd done a fair few Ks and uh, had a wee sleep between innings <laughs> and then fielded that first slip and got through the power play and Susie goes, uh, merely warm up. And my body, sh- I'm knackered. And then I warm- like, I had to bowl. I was like, Susie, really? <laughs> and then, yeah, got five wickets. Um, Amazing. Just hit, tried to hit the stumps. But, yeah, it's just. And go- going back to school after that, what was that like? Did you have to, have to make a speech at the school assembly or anything? Did did no one really care, or did yeah, was it a big deal? Uh, I think my my principal loves sports, so, um, but yeah, my friends at my school friends that weren't in sport knew nothing about cricket, so it was quite nice. <laughs> so you'd come home and they'd have no idea, or like they'd see and they'd be like, "That's cool." Yeah. Like, well, yeah. Cricket's a, yeah, it's quite a polarising sport, eh? Like, I, I really love cricket, but I, I can't think of many of my girl mates that have any interest Idea, in it yeah. at all. Yeah, so it was quite nice for me. Like, I just went back to school and was a teenager again, like I was just a kid. And, yeah, I didn't like being asked about cricket from my school friends as well. I just wanted to be a just kid. Really, yeah, um, yeah. And that was... Important, you know, it's like you'd get mentioned in school assemblies and stuff, and and all of that. But I had this thing growing up too, which is funny. It's I think it's a little bit like that New Zealand tall poppy syndrome. Yeah. But you know, I'd get a principal's award or go up for something at prize giving, and I just would go up straight face and look real like sad or angry <laughs> because I thought if you smiled, you looked arrogant. <laughs> So, so you'd get like an award, and shake their hand, and you'd just be like, nothing. <laughs> it's, it's almost like the thing your dad told you, like, I don't want to know if you won an award yeah, or lost an or award. Or not, so I'm just like, <laughs> deadpan, but it almost looks like I'm annoyed to get, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's funny that I just thought, you know, like, if you smile or mm. whatnot, it, then you look happy to receive it, and then you're arrogant, mm. right? Which is actually not the case, but when I was about 12, that's what I thought. Yeah. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> that's Which is funny. And then when, when did your sister make um, the team? So she's older than you, but she's she's not a – I get the feeling she's not as passionate about cricket as what you are. She she was like a 3,000-metre runner for a while. Yeah. Yeah, Which so like she loved her running. awful distance to run. I love running. It's yeah. a terrible distance. Yeah, she did that in uh, 1,500 metres. Um, but, yeah, so she loved her running. And then she's had injuries with her calves – 
Uh, she played cricket growing up, took a break um, from it, didn't really like cricket. Um, yeah, got bored. As most people, <laughs> that's why they give up. You gotta, if, if you're going to play cricket, you've got to love fielding. That's the key. But yeah, so she then started playing for Wellington again. Oh, I got in the Wellington squad when she was about 17, 18. But she always stayed in the game through playing indoor cricket. Um, and she had a couple really good years with Wellington. And 2020 made her White Ferns debut. So she would have been about 23. Right. Just turned 23, I think. Um, and she's been amazing for this group. Like, Has she? How so? Um, she just has a point of difference in women's cricket and swing bowling's been so effective, and we haven't had an in swinger for a while. And she's just come in and done really well with the new ball. And um, I think she doesn't quite know how good she is actually. Um, but yeah, it's awesome to see Jess loving it and and playing sport again because. You know, it's tough for her not being able to run. Um, and it's great having family on tour. We, we are like best mates, her and I. So, yeah. Well, did, did she, was she really good at the running, was she? Did she really love it? She loved it. Do you know what? Do you know, I, you know, you know how these people that don't know anything about cricket, I don't know if you know this, but what was her time? What was her time for like 1,500 so or 3,000? 1,500. That's when she was about 12. She did a 4.54 or 4.56. Wow. wow. And I'm pretty sure... She had a Wellington record for a 3K for, like, school, um, like, Wellington region. She did, like, a 10-something. No way. 3K. Fuck, that's insane. She was moving. At, at like, 12. Uh, 3K, she would have been a bit older. Right. Wow. And it's such an uncomfortable distance to run. Like, you just, yeah. your lungs are burning, burning from lap number one. Yeah. So, yeah. Awful. She's in a much better place now. I know. <laughs> Team don't, sport. Yeah. With everyone. <laughs> you don't need to go blow mm. your lungs every day. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the, the IPL, you played um, in um, India this year for yep. the, the Mumbai Indians. Um, how do you feel about that? The money side of things with everyone knowing, you know, you shit. Yeah. It's I mean, it's a whole other world over there. Because mm. um, you, you, got, you got sold for 192000 Yeah, 190 I think. Do you, if you don't want to talk about any, the money side of things, because it can, can be a bit crass, that's totally cool, but I, I'd, I'd be curious, like how, like, how much of that money do you actually see? Yeah, that's like, because all, all now with these contracts, your money is, comes out, and it's in a thing. I think, for me, like, I, leading into that, auction I was thinking oh it could be tough if you get sold for a lot of money because everyone's gonna see it and I just think for me as like a 22 year old I grew up in Tawa and went to Tawa College it's quite a diverse school um and you've got mates as well it's like I kind of fit you almost like feel guilty in a way yeah like success, which is weird. Gu- success guilt in a way yeah which yeah. is and you like this, uh, maybe part of that stems from, and I mean, this is all internally from your side, but it's, it's maybe it's tied up with that tall poppy thing a bit as well. Yeah, and there's like players that have played before you mm. that didn't play for much, but I mean, you got to look at it as an it's an amazing opportunity now for women's cricket, young girls seeing, um, seeing that like you can make a real career out of this, and you know if you're that's incredible it's not yeah. something to be embarrassed about it's fucking no. awesome yeah so like obviously you'd rather it not be shown to the media um <laughs> but, but it's still quite a badass yeah. in a way yeah. but it's pe- amazing yeah but pe- people see that and they're like shit she's getting 190k but you lose about 40 percent of it so yeah so 40 percent so to say tax tax yeah and then you got an agent to pay or like uh, to, yes. does someone get 15 yeah, percent 20 percent or yeah, for I don't have a agent that takes my cricket contracts. Mm. They'll take money from deals they get me. Oh, okay. Um, oh, how good. Oh, okay, so after tax, you're still lo- looking at yeah. like 100K or something. Yeah, yeah. Shit, that's amazing. Well, it's still great, isn't it? It's but incredible. Yeah. So are your parents still uh, teachers? Um, no. So all my aunties and uncles are. Um, my mum is actually with the... New Zealand Players Association. So she works on basically life outside of cricket with some of the men's domestic teams, uh, well-being, like P- mm. PD type of stuff. Um, and my dad, 
he he's he was the director of cricket Wellington uh, when I was about ten. My parents actually bought Kelly Sports to New Zealand, which was like sport for young kids. What is that? I've never heard of it. Um, this was ages ago, but uh, basically. Right. Just they run holiday programs, after school care, and they would go into primary schools and basically take PE lessons right. for schools. Because I think when my sister started school, mum and dad were shocked at like how the basic mm. skills of catching a ball and whatnot yeah. were just not there. And there's a thing in Aussie, so they brought it to New Zealand. Um, you, you and your sister never had a chance, eh, with the cricket? Yeah, no. <laughs> like you. It, yeah, do you know it's funny because when Jess was young, she, like, as soon as she was walking, she had a ball in her hair and, like, loved sport. And I was just a real chiller, like, oh, I was just sitting there, I'd, like, line up cars in a perfect order, like, a little bit OCD and... Just had no interest, and mm. my parents were like, oh yeah, Millie had no interest. She got into sport quite late. I was like five years old. Mm. <laughs> They're like, she got into it late. <laughs> Probably a, a normal age. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, 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 like the Indian money. What have you done with that? Have you bought a house or anything? Or yeah, you yes. have. Yeah, yeah. Fuck, that is so cool. So yeah. you, so you bought your first house at twenty two. Yeah. Insane. Yeah. So no, it's pretty cool and. I'm lucky again, family. Um, my dad's pretty pretty wise, pretty smart. So, um, yeah, he's helped me a lot, I think. I had my first white fence contract at 16, and that just got paid into my dad's account So, and, and just saved, really. Um, lucky I trust my dad because he could have just run away with it all. <laughs> <laughs> he, could, he could do. Yeah. Maybe he's in yeah. your career. You'd be like, where's all the money Yeah, where's gone? it gone? <laughs> One of those guys. Um, but yeah, no, it's um, it's cool, and I guess it allows you one to, I guess, do the things you love, um, and and live a good lifestyle, but also be able to give back as well to people that have helped you along the way, mm. and and do projects that you're passionate about as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, like the treading, like the water, treading thing. water. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's cool, and I think with it, it's like. It obviously allows you to do what you love. It allows me to do my job full time, mm. um, and and that's going to help me get the best out of myself. Yeah, and I feel like by the time you get to the end of your cricketing career, you'll be so um, set up and financially secure that you won't be driven by money anymore. So if you want to go back and be a teacher's aide, where you 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 know you're dealing with kids with behavioural issues or some which is something you've done before, mm. you better do that, and it won't even be about the money. It'll just be about you know doing what sparks joy for you. Yeah, which exactly. is really cool. It's and a, that's what you want to do. Like one hundred percent, you want to love the work you do, and you want to be passionate about it. So if I can do that in the future, mm. whatever that is, that's 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 what you want to do. And you know, money's never been a driver for me, um, but. It's just about... Give me some of it yeah. then. <laughs> <laughs> it's a drive yeah. me. I'll take some of you. So, um, what's, I've never been to India. What's it like? Is it fucking insane? Yeah. It's very, very different to that game we were talking about before where you, you know, you're playing Ireland and there's no one watching. No one there, yeah. Full stadium. Yeah. It's 50 to 80,000 people. Um, and they love cricket. Mm. So, yeah. They're next obsessed level. with it, eh? Yeah, obsessed. it's a is, religion. Is your... Um, it, I, I, I checked. I did some research on Instagram. Your sister's got about say fifteen thousand followers. You're on like quarter of a million. Did, did that just explode this year with yeah. the IPL thing? Yeah, it, did, so it mainly it Indians. Definitely did. Um, when I went over to India in like an exhibition match matches for the IPL in 2019, so that's kind of when it went up. Because previously to then, I had been private as well. Like because I was like, I'm still a kid. I just want like my Instagram to be nothing about cricket because I'm me. I'm not a cricketer. Mm. Um, and then yeah, went to India and it and it went up and they just love cricket. But I guess now too, there's more profile in New Zealand. It's becoming bigger mm. in New Zealand and in Australia. I think I've been playing for Brisbane since 2019 and like Aussie as mm. well and and there. So it, it goes up. But yeah, India is next level. Just yeah. They have they hire people to throw you balls at the nets. Like they're not even the coaches; they just hire them to come throw you balls. Wow! So it's just yeah, next wow. next level. That's crazy. Yeah, went to the Ambani's house, who basically sponsor our own our team, 
24 story house. Didn't see it all. <laughs> 24 story yeah, house. Yeah, 24 stories. <laughs> Uh, it seems they got they got Creed three for us before it was out. We watched it in the movie cinema. Uh, what floor was that on? Yeah, the house? Uh, second floor. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Had a popcorn machine. Like they were just yeah, they were oh actually God. very nice and and down to earth and um, they give a lot back. They obviously uh, have too much money, but they mm. do a lot of good with it, which is cool. But yeah, next level. Mm. But it's. Quite like the contrast over there, you know. You've got these mansions there, and then you've got the slums there. Yeah, it's so it's, it's crazy, isn't it? The juxtaposition yeah. between the, yeah. the haves and the have nots. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. It's ridiculous. Um, so, do, do, as your as your um, DMs just full of like Indian Indian do Indian fans. Yeah. I've, I, I haven't really looked at them, but I think you get a few like marriage proposals <laughs> and, and whatnot. So, um, I haven't said yes to any yet. <laughs> Oh, there's always time. <laughs> yeah. you still there's always time, time, you know. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> um, and what about um? Do you, are you superstitious? Do you have any like pregame routines or any any like must dos or like processes? Yeah, I used to be really superstitious when I was a kid. <laughs> I've chilled out a little bit now. Um, I always put my left pad on first and my left left glove. I have the same like routine, like batting routine, like two taps and whatnot. Um, but that's about it, really. Mm. Yeah, that's... So you're not an overthinker? No, I'm not an mm. overthinker of sport. I'm an overthinker of life. Yeah. Actually, that's probably a good transition time. We'll get into that now. So, um, <laughs> yeah, July July 2020, that's when... Can you, I don't know if you want to... How, like, we can get into this in as, as much or as little information as you want. Because, I, I, I mean, dragging this shit back up, I know it's never never nice and never easy. But what was what was going on then, July 2020? Yeah, 2020 um, was, when was it? So that's kind of when COVID start, yeah, started, it didn't it? pandemic time, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's when my friend's brother committed suicide that year. Um, and then obviously, like, the lo- I loved lockdown because I felt like the world stopped around me and I felt like we were, like, at peace, and I know it was horrible for some people, and I had a good household, but um, I guess I keep busy and whatnot, but I just felt like the world stopped, and I could be, I just felt safe, like I found a safe place, Um, and I was still able to do everything I love, like I'd exercise, I'd hit balls with my dad outside and whatnot, Um, and then we went over to... Australia. So we played Australia in a series over there, and we were in full lockdown mode. So two weeks, like isolate isolation there, but we could hang out in the, as a team in the hotel, and we could go out once a day for training um, to start. And otherwise, we were inside the hotel. And then after that, I then went to Big Bash, and all eight teams were in a hub. So like. Far out, it was overwhelming. Yeah. So many people. And I'm like, I love people. I'm a people person. But I also, like, need my own time too. Um, and so, basically, I was in a bubble for three months. And I just um, really, really struggled over there. Um, being away in this, like... Because cricket's never been for me, like, how I define myself. And it's always been, I've always had interests outside of cricket. And I like, like, I love cricket. And when I'm there, I'm there. But when I'm away from it, I'm away from it. And then I was living in this bubble with eight teams, squads of, what, 15, 17, all in this one place, playing cricket. It was like you couldn't escape. And um, that was really tough. And I know a lot of people found it tough there Mm. and, I think I had been struggling a lot before that as well, just with, I guess, I, I, around, I think, my values and what I felt like I had to be, and I had to be, like, that perfect person. I had to be there for everyone around me who was struggling. Um, I couldn't take the time to look after myself because everyone else's needs were more important than mine. And then... 
I came home from Australia and kind of just shifted what was like important to me. I got into gratitude and and read a lot and journaled a lot and then it was really good over summer um, when I when I came home from that and then in 2021 I kind of had a relapse or relapse but in 2020 I remember going what I went through and I said I'm so glad I went through what I went through. So, so you went through. <coughs> sorry for interrupting. You went, you went through that, and you didn't sort of tell anyone or talk to anyone about that. No, I. You just sort of worked so your way I out. was I was seeing a psychologist right. in 2020 from about June. Okay, and that's when you didn't even tell your sister, and she, you didn't you, tell you were my on the sister. Road with her you, why didn't, didn't why, tell my mum or dad? I didn't want anyone to know. Right, but even not, not even. Did, did, do you think in hindsight you wore a really good mask? I think I did. Yeah. I learned how to. I learned how to do that, and mm. I. Because my thing was, what I feel doesn't matter. It's about me making sure everyone else around me is okay, and then you know, I <laughs> I can see parallels. Like I'm I'm exactly the same. I I, I think I get, I get some validation out of being the the, the person that's got the answers, or yeah, yeah, the person that can solve the problem. Yeah, yeah. And it was just it's, like it's mental though. Like, it's dumb. Yeah, it was it's like completely dumb. Yeah, and it was always like I don't want to be. Like, as in seen as ungrateful. Like, I have mm. an amazing family and I do what I love. And that's like all you can really ask for in life. Mm. And so for me to be sad and feel the way I did, I was like, that's so ungrateful. People have it so much worse. Was it like an element of guilt in a way? Yeah. Yeah. And so I... But why didn't you tell, tell your sister? I'm, I'm, I'm curious because I'm... I, and it's, there's no judgment involved yeah. so I'd be exactly the same. Mm. If I was on a, in a team with my brother, I probably wouldn't have told him when I was going through shit as well but but why not I think I just thought I don't want anyone I don't want anyone in my family to help me because I didn't want to bring them into it and I didn't want them to worry and I didn't You're want sort of protecting them in a way yeah I don't want them to feel sad I I was like this is me it's not you guys so you don't need to know about it and then I think I remember this was like just before going to Australia I was around it um Mum and Dad's for dinner, and Mum was talking to me about something, and I—I I think she was like probably annoyed at me. Um, me and my mum, my, my mum get along well, but I've probably done something like I just not been myself, and she was trying to check in on me. Yeah, actually, I—I I, um, I read somewhere on online. Uh, apparently, you changed how you were acting around home, and you were even started avoiding home, avoiding yes. going back home. Is that around this time? Yes, yeah, they around that time, twenty twenty. So, so, people, so, so your family sort of started. They to notice probably things. picked up on little things like I. What, do you, what were you just more? You just weren't your usual jovial self, or yeah, I was pretty quiet. Um, I would get up early, train, be out all day training. Then you know I'd get home. Didn't want to be home because I didn't want them. I didn't want to have to fake how I was feeling for too long in front of my family because faking's hard. It's tiring. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. tiring hiding yeah. hiding your emotions. So then I'd go to the pool, I'd go to the sauna, um, and it was also like I'm recovering as well, and then I'd come home, have dinner, go to bed, repeat, and just do that on repeat all day. And I guess in a way my parents probably thought, oh, Millie's always trained hard. She was always, she's just training really hard rather than, Avoiding home, but I think they started to see a change. Like you could also probably see a change physically um, as well. You can see it in people's faces sometimes. And mm. yeah, Mum tried to bring it up with me, and I just broke down and like had a panic attack, and was kind of like, I have no idea how I'm feeling right now. Yeah, what, what is and it? Then, what do you mean a panic attack? What does that look like? Just like the breathing, the hyperventilating, yeah. like you can't control yourself, like your whole body feels paralysed. And that's what I experienced a lot of over in Australia when I was there for those three months. Like sleeping was hard, couldn't really sleep. And then, yeah, the panic attacks and the anxiety would just set me off. Some lyrics, songs, music set me off. And I would just, yeah, like... We had to go through this like custom, like the back of a the workers lift, and you could only have like three people in the lift at a time for the whole team. So it took forever, and you'd just be waiting in this place, and 
just the anxiety too, like his depression and anxiety all at once and it just would overwhelm you and you have no idea why. And I think that's the hardest thing when you have no idea why, what's happening. Yeah, especially if you're doing all the right things. Like, you, you know, you're, you're keeping yourself physically fit. You're getting up in, yeah. in the morning. You're cracking on with the day. You, you're, you know, uh, practicing gratitude. Yeah. You're doing all the things that should, you know, elevate your mental yeah, health. Yeah, I remember writing once, like, um, you know, all the mental health guides and all that stuff. It's like, mm. I see all of that and I'm doing all of that, but it will never be good enough. Like, mm. what I do will never be good enough. And it was kind of like, because I was trying, I was doing everything, and my mindset was like, well, what I do is just never good enough. Mm. Um, so that was kind of 2020, I guess. Yeah. So then, um, okay, so, so, so you went through that, um, then you sort of came right again. How, can you remember how you came right? Or did it just um, sort of happen? I was talking to like a psychologist weekly, yeah. and, and weekly while I was overseas as well, and um, I shifted a little bit of that perspective of the not good enough, the perfectionism. I don't have to do everything at my best standard. I don't have to be perfect. Like, I don't expect my friends to... Like, what I expected from myself, I don't expect that from anyone else. Mm. So I was trying to shift that. How I talk to others is the old, like... I need to talk to myself a little bit more like yeah, is that. Yeah, is your inner voice, are you quite hard on yourself? Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God, I'm exactly the same. <laughs> it's terrible, eh? Like the inner critic, it's terrible. Yeah. It's like um, I, I, I say to people, like, I, I would never, the way I speak to myself sometimes, I would never accept that from another human being. No. Family member or otherwise. It's yeah. like I, I, I can be a bully to myself. Yeah, actual bully. And it's gotten so much better. I during that time I found running for me also like because I wouldn't sleep at night and I just couldn't sleep couldn't sleep and mm. I'd go for a run and I liked running at night because I felt faster you know it when you're running <laughs> you do feel faster yeah, right? you do you're not the Garmin <laughs> yeah. doesn't lie yeah still the same minute case but yeah <laughs> so I'd, I'd just run but I'd just get in this like I think too for a while like what I felt was either so much pain. Or I'd feel numb. And so I found that with running at night and, and whatnot, going for runs, it was like I was feeling so much pain that the pain of running felt good. Mm. As in I could just cope with so much pain. And But then if I felt numb, it was like the pain of making myself go run at this time mm. was like... At least I felt something. It's almost like a, a, a healthy form of, um, you know, you know how there's people that self harm. Yeah, just so they feel something. It's almost like yeah, a it's he- like running, healthy version of that. Yeah, kind of like running. Doing running for me was like that version for me. But also, my, one of my like, first warning signs is eating. Like if I feel guilty after eating, I know I'm probably late going into a little bit of a bad phase. Need a check in on myself, look after my mental health and those are probably were mm. my two my two warning signs are probably going for runs at night and <laughs> and and eating. Okay. All right, good to know. So yeah. if anyone ever sees Mealy Kira running eating at night, night. <laughs> eating while running. Yeah. There you go. Um, and then um so was it twenty twenty one that you had um so like the, the 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 relapse or incident, whatever yeah. you want to call it, this was even this was the real rock bottom, right? Yeah, rock so bottom. So got even, got even worse. What what brought that on? What was the catalyst of? Yeah, I again like. Don't know. I, I've done a lot of writing that kind of explains a lot into how I was feeling, um, and yeah, twenty twenty one, I got and I wasn't good again, and I think it was still things from the past and. I think it was actually things from basically when I was 18 through to 21 that I'd never dealt with as well. Like like what? I think I'd never processed anything. And when I was a kid, um, all those things I reckon that shaped part of my identity and just seeing other people struggle as a kid and the suicide happening around me and... um, I guess I had a different life as well to a normal teenager as well, and I had to grow oh, up. In terms of the cricket, yeah, and, I had to grow yeah. up. I had to grow up quickly, um, 
But yeah, in 2021, I then used cricket as my only place in the world where my mind stopped. So like cricket was meditation. Going to train was meditation because my head finally stopped spinning. Like the voice in my head finally stopped. And then broke my finger. Mm. And so that like place of safety for me had gone. Um, like I'd still run in gym, so I had that kind of escape for me. Um, but yeah, I, I lost my safety and I was also that perfectionism again. It was like, I want to be the best I can be. And if I'm injured, I can't be the best I can be. I'm not going to get any better. I'm going to fall behind all of that. Um, Someone else is going to take my spot. Yeah, it's like all oh. those feelings of um, of that. But then I I was really in a really bad place, struggling, and um, again didn't tell my family. It's funny because you know throughout that time in 2020, once my family knew, they helped me so much. Mm. But then again, started seeing my psychologist again and didn't tell my family. So it kind of went back into old habits of I've got to hide this. I can't show anyone how I'm feeling. Um, would you, if it, if it happens again, and let's hope it doesn't, would you, would you, would you be more comfortable speaking out? Do you think if it happened again, or do you think you'd uh, this is your default setting where you're just going to, you know, you find it yeah. hard to speak until it's really fucking bad? I'd like to say I would yeah, um, yeah. speak early. I actually. I really struggled in May this year, and um, I didn't tell anyone again, but I did after two weeks of really struggling, and I saw a psychologist, a different one, because my one moved back to England, which I was very sad about, Um, and I was like, oh, I've been feeling like this for the last two-ish, three weeks. Mm. and didn't kind of seek help or get help till then. And I just kind of thought, well, before that, how I was feeling, I was feeling like that for so long, and I thought, you know, I'm just feeling bad at this time, it's going to pass. Mm. But actually feeling like how I was feeling for two weeks, it's that's not normal. Yeah, you, it's a long time. But I guess from my tolerance or from how I felt in the past, it was like months or, mm. you know, so... Yeah, it, it takes me a while. I try process it myself. I try help myself before telling anyone. Um, but at the end of the day, like I'm advocating p- for people to speak up. I want people to be able to tell people and speak up. But sometimes um, <laughs> yeah, you, you got to yeah, tell yourself that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you feel like a hypocrite in a way. Yeah, but you, I think you know like, the right things to yeah. do, but you still don't want to do it yeah but there's so much power in being vulnerable and I think I've found that too even now just with relationships with people and the team like my friends it's just like every conversation is more open everything's Mm. more honest you have a deeper level of I guess understanding you like you truly truly understand and care for them Mm. on this level and you just check in on your mates and I think that's been the most powerful thing for me and my family and friend group is we're more hyper-aware and we understand it more. Um, But, yeah, it's like I don't need to feel bad for two weeks before I get help. I can do it after a few days. That's cool. Yeah, the vulnerability thing's interesting. eh? I I would, up until a few years ago, have described myself as completely um, invulnerable, if that's if that's a word. But I'm like I'm older than you. Like I went to an all boys school in the 1980s. It was a different generation. Um, So it's fucking hard for me. But it's the best thing ever. Yes, so empowering. Yeah, it just opens it opens people up because actually everyone's got shit going on in their Mm. life. Everyone. Has stuff going on upstairs, you know. Oh, so. mate, that's one one. I, I, I stopped seeing a therapist around about the same time I started this podcast, and um, I, I've actually found doing this podcast quite cathartic because you realise that everyone's carrying shit. Yeah, absolutely everyone. People yeah. that even people that you wouldn't even expect. No, um, it's um, indis- indiscriminate, you know, and everyone's going to go through stuff. So I did. Um, 
So when was it that your, your, your family staged like an intervention of sorts? When was that? Yeah, was that so 2021? 2021. Yeah. So, yeah, I was just in the worst possible place again. Um, was this the broken finger? Yeah, and I think, again, just like all those thoughts in my head as well from things that have happened in the past as well that I felt like, yeah. what could have I done better? Yeah. Um, in certain situations and and whatnot, and in, ter- in terms of um, the suicides around you, n- oh, no. not so much that, but just like why, why I'm trying to understand mm. and and just other things like yeah. try, yeah. I just I don't really know in a way, mm. um, but yeah, I guess. I was in a horrible place, and I wasn't sleeping at all. Um, I was probably not eating enough and exercising too much. And I, yeah, just panic attacks. Just I just couldn't fuck. I was, like, a shell of myself. Like, I didn't even look like me. I had nothing to me, and I just got tired of pretending, I guess, and... Mm putting on a brave face, um, and I had had, like, a few moments where it just, because it was so continuous, I never got a break, like, there was never any good moments, I never had a good moment, I'd cry every morning when I woke up, because the day was scary, I didn't want to face the day, and then I'd cry every night, because I didn't want to repeat the same process, and I was scared of going to sleep, because... Of like things like I just couldn't sleep. Like I closed my eyes and just terrible. Like it's almost like hallucinations and and whatnot. So I was just constantly in this cycle and I couldn't get out of it for how long? Um, I'd say like that for about two months, maybe. Oh my god! Um, just running off no sleep and then. I went to Maddie Green, who's in the White Ferns, and I would just go, I, I was, I wouldn't even tell her, but I just went round, drove round, knocked on her front door at about, you know, late at night, and she just knew that I was like, I was like, you tell I've been crying. I'd actually come from sitting at a lookout, just contemplating, I guess, life. Why should I be here? And then... I did you did you did you contemplate taking your own life? Yeah, I think throughout that two month process, I because it's a long time to be exhausted, to, eh? Yeah, it's a long time. Those two months, I suicide was on my mind every single day. Um, there was once where so there was once where I was in my car, and I had. I had all these pills for like a injured wrist and I was in my car and I just wanted to take them all. I wanted to, I just wanted the pain to go away mm. in that moment. Yeah, 100%. That's, and, that's what it is. Eh? Yeah. You just want the pain to stop. I just wanted it to stop and I was like, if people know what I'm going through, like I'm bringing my family's life down. How can I do this? And so I, yeah, in my car like panic attack because it was like, Fuck, this is what I want to do, but you know that's obviously a scary decision to make, mm. and I obviously didn't. And then I, a few weeks later or whatever, was at this lookout, and then just sat there because like it was a beautiful night, and I just found something so like peaceful in that. Yeah. But it also made me sad because it was like I saw beauty in that, but there was no like beauty in my life or how I was feeling. And then I was like, got in my car again, drove to Maddie's house. I think I actually went to call my dad and he didn't answer, but I heard his voice message and that just broke me. I was like, I love my dad. And so I went to, but he can't know how I'm feeling. Mm. I went to Maddie's and stayed with Maddie that night. And that ended up being a common theme that I was at her house most nights and she just... She didn't even necessarily talk to me. Like I, She's there. I sat at like her table with her when I came in that <coughs> night. And she was there and I was here and I was just like this. 
like like almost like a catatonic sort yeah, of state, just or like something. couldn't talk. Yeah, could not talk, and she knew, like she knew from how I was, but I just I couldn't tell her anything, and I didn't want to tell her the thoughts I was having because I didn't want to scare her. And then people would ask me, like Maddie would, and our PDM would ask me. Because you do have to ask at times, are you suicidal? And I'd say, I think about it a lot, but I will never do it. Mm. Which was a lie, because I had thought about it. And then I was no good, and I just thought I needed to get away, because Wellington, I was finding, obviously, like, my routine there was horrible, because every day was hard, and we had a training camp in Christchurch, and I was like, I just need to get to that training camp because I'll be at cricket I'll be in my happy place and I just need to make it there um and I guess that was my mindset I'm getting to Christchurch so got on the plane and at that point in time Maddie had I was on antidepressants and everything and Maddie had taken all my pills with me um, so she had all of that and I was just going to have one each day from her and I was sitting on the window seat and I looked out the window on the plane and it was the most beautiful night I love Wellington, I have a beautiful city you can't yeah. beat it on a good, good day apparently. no you can't beat it on a good day <laughs> <laughs> and I just looked out and I was like wow this is beautiful mm. like this place is beautiful and this is and it just hit me in that moment this is the last time I'm ever going to see this city. And I started crying on the plane. What, what did you mean? What like, as in, I'm going to Christchurch away from my family. Um, and I'm not going to see Wellington again because I want this pain to end. And if I end it in Christchurch, my family aren't going to have the pain of finding me. Really? This is heartbreaking. And... Yeah, it was, fuck, it was, yeah. We got to Christchurch. We went to the supermarket, um, like, got stuff. I went and bought as many pills as I could. Um, and I just couldn't, like, the only pain I ever felt, it was, that's the only thing I felt, was like, my head was sore, my head was screaming, like, my body was tired, I was like, I was treading water, and, yeah, I then went out that night in Lincoln, and I just, I went for a walk, and went to out of the room, and I had all these pills in my pocket, and whatnot, and I wrote a note, actually, in my room, for mum, dad and Jess and I just remember walking and I, there was a security guard on campus and I was so like this is what I'm doing in my own head and the security guard on campus came and spoke to me and he was like hey are you okay and it's like it brought me back to reality because I was not in like I was not in my I was in this world that only I was thinking about and, and like, my pain. And he just, random guy said, are you okay? Amazing. I bet he's got no idea of the impact that he had. Yeah. And I what just, did you just say? Yeah, sweet ass. I said, yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yeah. Just going for a walk. But it just, it just brought me back to life mm. in a way. Um, Can you remember that, the, uh, the note you wrote? Did yeah. You, did you keep it? I, I have it. I can read it, actually. I yeah, would you? Yeah. Sorry. Only if it's... Yeah, only if you want. I, um, so then I... Maddie found me. And I... They had to let the psychologist know. And I got... Um, yeah, sent home the next day. And I just didn't want to go home because I had to face the people that I love the most in the world. Yeah, and that's tough because I just love my family so much, and I knew what I was feeling. I wouldn't wish that upon anyone. 
God, the, 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 the brains are, it's, it's a fucked up part of the body, the eh? Brown, the brain's horrible. <laughs> it makes no sense at all. Yeah. Uh, um, Maddie flew home with me. Yeah. And well, I said to Maddie, because Jess wasn't at camp, she was sick or something. And I flew home from that camp and was like, Maddie was like, you have to tell someone. Like, someone's got to stay with you tonight. So I said, okay, Jess and Zach, who's her boyfriend, can come over and they can stay with me. But mum and dad can't know. They can't know anything. Um, so I got home. Jess and Zach were there. And then mum and dad, because I was in a, fl- in a flat, and mum and dad came over. And I could tell they looked sad, like they'd been crying. And then I'd gone to my room to go get some space, and my uncle and auntie walk in, and I just broke down. Mm. Like, my grandparents came in. And there were some really powerful things said that night. Like, my dad read a speech out that he read some of it on his, like, treading water monologue. Yeah, it's incredible, by the way. Yeah, it was powerful. Man, and it, yeah, so it's like a two-minute speech, but took it, he was so um, emotional. It took him like ten minutes to yeah. get through it. And I'd only seen him cry once before at his mum's funeral. Mm. And then... So he's a, has he got better at um, crying and showing emotion through? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so after that speech, he cried every day for a month. Mm. Um, Just because of your pain? Yeah. Oh, my God. And then, I guess, yeah... I'm, I think the, uh, my grandma spoke and she said, I don't know how many years Popper and I have left, but without you we have no good years left. Mm. And then my sister Jess, powerful, was said, I remember growing up, because family's been our thing, like, I remember growing up we talked about we were gutted mum and dad didn't have more kids and they wanted more kids, <laughs> actually. They wanted more kids, but mum's cancer didn't allow that. Right. Um, and we, like, me and Jess didn't know that. So when we were young, we're like, we wish we had more brothers and sisters because we yeah. wanted, uh, we want our kids to have what we had growing up with all mm. the cousins. And Jess was like, and we've talked about that and how, like, we want our kids to be, like, best mates. And she was like, if I don't, if you're not here, my kids don't get that. Mm. Like, I don't get to be an auntie and uncle to to your kids. And that, like, everything broke me. Like It's heartbreaking. There was not a dry eye in, in that room. And then the next day I went to, mum and dad took me to the crisis team to hospital and I was there about eight, nine hours and... I was then in yeah, waiting time, waiting time to get seen by someone. Oh, oh, okay, wow. And then I spoke to a psychiatrist and two, um, I guess, people that work in the mental health unit there. I was in the room for them with 90 minutes talking about stuff and felt like 30. And then they took mum and dad in, spoke to them about a plan, um, Started seeing a psychiatrist as well as a psychologist weekly. Got on more medication. Um, and then, yeah, basically from there, they told mum and dad what to do. I didn't have it. I wasn't allowed to be alone. So for about maybe six weeks, I had to sleep next to mum or dad. Yeah, yeah. I think I read this and you weren't allowed to drive a car. Yeah, or I'm not anywhere. allowed to drive a Was car. Was it still like, um, like suicide watch in a way? In a way, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so... Mm. My family wrapped around me and... How did you feel at the time? Were you annoyed by that or were you appreciative of it? I think at that time I just needed that. Yeah. And after seeing my family, that intervention, it was like, yes, I still feel the exact same. But I've seen my family and I've seen that. And I was like, at that time it was, I'm going to get better for my family because they need me here. Did it feel like a relief though, like this huge secret that you'd got It was, it was. It was like, it felt like I was finally going to get the help I needed. Mm. And you didn't, yeah, you you, you didn't, you didn't have to hide or keep it to yourself anymore. It's like that. It must have been so cathartic. It was almost like that point in time where it's like sometimes you have to break down to break through and Mm. I reached my absolute, absolute lowest. Mm. Fuck, it's a long, it's a, it's a long hard road back though. Eh, when you're mm. at that rock bottom, yeah, and mm. yeah, and then we went into um, 
But I, in that eight hours, I wrote down everything I'd been feeling. Um, everything I'd been feeling. And then I read that out about three weeks later to all my family. And I think for me, like, for so long, it's probably, like, only recent, not in the last few few months or six months, where I used to write how I felt, and then almost that's how I expressed my emotions. So I'd write it and give it to mum or dad. That's how I communicated because talking was too hard. I couldn't mm. talk, like... This podcast, you tell me to do that, I don't know, eight months ago. Like, talking was too hard, mm. but writing was my coping mechanism. And I wrote down everything because I saw the vulnerability my family showed to me in that moment, and I wanted them to understand it all. Um, so I wrote down, and I've kept it all. Like, yeah, write, writing is a great way to process your thoughts, eh? Get them down on the page. Yeah, just like, for mm. me, it was became... I wrote down everything and that was off my chest. Yeah. And then I got from writing to reading my writing out and it was like another weight off mm-hmm. my chest. Um, but I'm, that in the hospital is when I wrote the treading water. My like, I've been treading water for too long because that's ex- cause my mum asked me, how are you feeling? And I just thought for someone that hasn't felt this pain or gone through this before... It's hard to explain. So how can I visually explain it? So that's the analogy you came up so with. So that's, yeah, yeah, what I wrote to mum and dad that that day. Um, mm, I like it. It's a great analogy. Mm. And uh, I, if you want to take the analogy even further, I guess um, like when you were down south and you're at your absolute rock bottom, it's like you're treading water but the waves are coming over at the same time. Yeah. It's not catching a break. Not, Yeah. Just constantly, yeah. constantly. And that gets too tiring if you do it's it for exhausting. too long. Yeah, you can't. You can't survive doing it for too long. And I guess that's the position I was in. Um, but, yeah, I'd like, wrote a bit to um, my mum as well. And I just said, I, I had said to her, like, I just feel every emotion so deeply and I've always been sensitive and worried about things. But through it all, my family is what I live for because I don't want to be without you. And that's why I hugged you for so long yesterday. Sometimes it feels like I want everything to stop. I thought maybe it would be easier for me and everyone else not to be here because I would bring every, everyone down with me. But I know how much you care and how much you love me. That's why I find it hard to talk to you about it sometimes because because I don't want to make you sad or hurt when you have done nothing wrong. Sometimes it's hard telling the people you're close to things because I want to protect you all. Um, oh. And I... Jeez. Had um, this, like, from the from today... Till however long, till today, it has been the hardest period of my life. I don't think I've slept for over over weeks. I think every night the thought of suicide crossed my mind and it scared me so much. I had gone for a 5k run on Monday night and then for a drive to a lookout. I was in my car crying, contemplating life. I'd googled ways to commit suicide, but I knew deep down that it wasn't what I wanted to do. It felt like it was my it was my brain telling me I had to do it. Luckily, I decided to go to Maddie's. The first person I felt comfortable to talk about all these thoughts with. She called me and I answered the phone and went to her place. I felt dead inside. Maddie stayed with me that night and since then she has been my constant support. Maddie, you helped keep me alive. I'm so sorry I put so much on you and that for a while you are my only person to talk to You provided me with safety and with your love and support, you have enabled me to still be here standing today, asking for more help. Alongside Jess, I couldn't ask for a better big sister. Um, Oh, my God. And then, (laughs) yeah, there's a lot of writing on here. I don't even know these people that you're talking about, but I'm feeling emotional. Yeah, This is a lot. Wow. Um, How do you feel reading that back now? I've, Does it still make you emotional or are you... It makes me emotional, um, but I've read it almost so many times now. Mm. 
but it does make me feel emotional. And I think, like, I haven't shown many people this stuff, mm. uh, my family and a couple of my closest friends. I mean, there's a lot in here that some of it I'll probably never, ever share yeah. um, to the world. But there's stuff in it that I just, it helped me so much, this writing. Mm. Um, reading it to my family helped them as well. Um it sounds like your family is all we're close anyway, but is, it, is your family closer now, do you yeah, think? All, yeah, so close, yeah. but so much closer now. Um, so much closer. Mm. And have you, got a, have you got a plan now? Like what if you, you know, what if something happens and you end up spiralling again? Like have you got a resilience plan now or what do you, it seems, see this is the yeah. thing, it feels like you're doing everything right anyway. Yeah, I you think I mean? for me it's just being really aware of my Emotions, um, that's probably the main thing. And I guess just trying to keep in good habits. Mm. Like sometimes I just got to find the balance right, I think, Mm. in my life as well. Like with the over, can be too busy at at times. But I think for me, I know what makes me happy. And if I can do that as much as possible. um, And I'm... More open now. I'm kinder to myself. I will tell my family I have an amazing partner who just gets me and supports me, and I know I can tell him how I feel, which before that I wouldn't have never done with any other partner. Mm, I love that. Has he has he experienced any mental health issues himself, or no? No, he hasn't. No. Um, my, um, when I was married, my wife JJ, she this, this is like five, six years ago now, she had um, some terrible mental health episodes, Mm -hmm. like what you sort of imagine, like um, where she just couldn't get out of bed. And I I look back now and I handled it completely the wrong way. Like Mm. I'd... And it came from a well-meaning place, but I'd come yeah. home from work and I'd be like, "Come on, let's uh, let's open the curtains. We'll get out there, get some vitamin D." And, yeah, you know. And I look back now, and it's like, "Fuck, man, you're an idiot." So it's really cool that you've got a partner who's the same age as you. Uh, he's a bit old, twenty-five. Yeah, right, yeah, it's, but still very, very young. young. And his twenties, that he's got that sort of empathy and understanding. I yeah, it's really cool. I think, like, a big sign for me was I didn't really speak to people that I just met about my mental health stuff and I'd met him and like we'd kind of had a friendship before and and then when we were together I told him really early on and read out like all my stuff I'd wrote before and I was Shut, like first date yeah first date <laughs> shit he's probably like get it all out on the table yeah, yeah he's probably like shit I'm gonna run now <laughs> no it wasn't quite first date <laughs> otherwise we probably wouldn't be together wouldn't yeah. be together um but, yeah, I just felt comfortable enough to yeah. tell him that. And, yeah, he, he hasn't had any struggles. Well, he's had struggles, obviously. Mm. Everyone has struggles, but not to the, like, a mental illness, I guess. Mm. Um, but, yeah, even today, like, every time I read something out or talk about experience, he just cries. Mm. <laughs> but, yeah, he's... Wow, that's cool. Oh, he sounds like a good dude. yeah. He's a good guy. Yeah, um, yeah. One thing, like from doing this podcast, you realise that everyone, um, if you haven't had any struggles yet, you count yourself lucky. But you are at some point in life. Like Adam Perori, do you, do you, are you familiar? Adam, I know the New yeah, Zealand cricket wicketkeeper yeah. from probably before you were born. Yeah. Um, but he was like cocky and brash and a very, very good, very good cricketer. Mm-hmm. Um, massive, massive ego. Yeah. You know, at, at the peak of his career, everyone sort of thought he was like kind of a tool, I guess. Um, and he, he he got through life just fine. And then had a relationship break up in his late forties, and was like couldn't leave the couldn't leave wow. the house, and was having panic attacks and stuff. Mm. So you never know when it's going to get gonna you. happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happens to different people at different times. Yeah, but the um so, so um with that that big incident in twenty twenty one, that's when you tapped out of cricket for a while, and um they they could have ju- it could have just been said that you were unavailable for selection, but um you were very very firm in your. Um, messaging and that you wanted people to know that it was a, mm. like a mental health thing. Yeah. Um, which I, I think that was really cool. Were you nervous about doing that? Yeah. Shitting yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I was I really think. nervous. Um, yeah. I, you know, I could have said I'd broke my finger and I, I, I could have. It's not available yeah, for selection. It's not available. Yeah. I could have said anything, but I thought this is actually something I'm 
passionate about mental health and I've seen other people close to me struggle. So if I hide away from it, then like I can't expect the stigma to change. Mm. So, yeah, I wanted to be open because that was the reason why I wasn't going on tour because I needed to be home. I needed to be, you know. to heal. Yeah. I needed to heal just like people need to heal from injuries. I needed to heal from what I was going through. Mm. Um, So, yeah, if I couldn't, I can't, you can't expect change. I couldn't expect change in our mental health system or anything and I don't want to be a hypocrite in that way Mm. so I wanted to be honest and I thought you know if someone else sees that and sees me being honest maybe it can encourage them to speak up yeah and is that sort of the idea of um treading water is that sort of how that came about yeah around that time yeah yeah so treading water by the way it's bloody great it's fantastic thank Um, you yeah, out of the rough. Nz is the website, and Treading Water is the name of the name of the series. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, so I obviously then started. Well, I got back into playing. Well, I was still training and everything once I could, and um, then played that Home World Cup and started twenty twenty two, and we then had we went on to our leave period after that. But throughout that World Cup, I thought, what am I going to do on leave? Um, What's something I can do while I'm at home? <laughs> Loves a project. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought about this idea and it kind of just came to me. I wrote up a little plan, whatnot. Um, I got in touch with a psychologist who knew Mike King, gave him a call and said, this is what I want to do. I want to interview these people. I want to do high profile, not so high profile because it affects us all. Mm. Um, and everyone's story is so different. And like the, my dad's perspective, I wanted it from a parent's perspective and how to help. So called him, kind of said, oh, I want to interview the people. And I know someone who's very good um, film photographer, freelancer. And I know him and we work well together. And he was like, I love the idea. And then for a while I was thinking, like me and Hamish who filmed it, were like, how are we going to raise money for this project? Because film's obviously expensive. And then... Were you like, I'll just get India for a couple of months, yeah, leave it with yeah. me. <laughs> At that point there was no India. No, no, no. <laughs> how did you raise yeah. the money? Well, I'm, it's why I'm Hope have been All so right. supportive. Oh, so we we're like thinking about it and Mike was like, oh, that's pretty, pretty um, cheap for what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Like the work you're putting in and... For, you know, it's amazing what I've, um, the support I'm Hope have shown us, Hamish and I, through this project and that Mike kind of gave us full trust and and let us let us do this. And it's been, to this day, it's like the best thing I'm most proud of in my life. Like I'm more proud of that. Um, kinda, scoring 232 yeah. against Ireland, come yeah. on. <laughs> no, it's no, it's a, no the, uh, I agree, like sport's one thing. but um, Yeah, sport's yeah. the thing I love and what I work really hard for and everything, but this is what I've turned a horrible experience into and to hopefully help other people that, for me, that is today the greatest thing I've ever done. Mm. Yeah, you're proud of yourself? I am... Proud of treading water, <laughs> and I am I am proud of who I am today from where I've come from. Yeah, and I want to keep being better <laughs> every day. But I'm proud of the journey I am on and and where I'm at where I'm at today. Mm. And I'm yeah, yeah. That keep, keep keep getting better thing. It comes back to that perfectionism thing we talked about before. Eh? It's a good yeah. good thing, it's but good not thing. always a good thing. Yeah. yeah. I noticed you got some tattoos as well. Have you got a ta- this two shall pass? Did yeah, I this two shall pass. That's what my papa said to me. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's an Abraham Lincoln quote, I think. Uh, the old US yeah. president, but it's a, it's a great one, eh? Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah, it is a good one. So he said that to me at that family intervention. Yeah. He's, yeah, great mm. man. Yeah. Well, that's, hey, thanks for being so open about all this stuff. No, thank is it, you. Is it hard for you to talk about, or does it get any easier? Um, it gets easier. Mm. It but like, how will you feel like, when, when I when I leave here in a few minutes? How will you feel? Is it, is it exhausting talking about it? 
Um, I feel like I've gotten a lot better. It used to be mm. bloody tiring yeah. talking about it. Um, the scariest part is when it comes out online. Because when you talk, you're talking about it. The scariest part is listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and or listen. people messaging you because they've heard yeah. it or whatever. The scariest part is knowing that people are going to hear this. Yeah, that's the scary part. But it's um. But it's worth it. It's you're powerful. Doing, it's impactful. You're, you're doing it to help others, and you got to bring it back to your why. But that's the scariest part for me. Absolutely, and and. Uh, People have to listen to like an hour of us talking about cricket before they get to this I stuff. I know, they might the give up. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, well, end with some light-hearted ones. Um, cool. uh, thanks for being so open about, about that. Um, I just realised the other day, so um, the Olympics are on in Brisbane in 2032. 2032, so you'll, that's, um, what, nine years from now? No, yeah. yeah. Yeah, nine years from now, so yeah. you'll be 31. Yes. So you probably don't want to get that far ahead of yourself, but it's I entirely possible that um, that cricket will be a sport at the, those games, and so you could go to the Olympics. Yes, that is cool, and I love Brisbane. I have like a little bit of a connection now, being with the Brisbane Heat. So great city, and yeah, growing up, you watch the Olympics, and you think that's that's the that's what you want to be. That's the pinnacle, really. Yeah. Eh? Amazing. Yeah, because you didn't see Women's World Cups mm. on TV, but you saw the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. So that's a childhood dream. Shit, how good. And entirely possible. Yeah. Entirely possible. What, what, have you thought about what you want to do beyond cricket? Or nah? Um, I do think about it. I, Are you still studying? You're doing it? No, like a, I'm not studying at the moment. Um, no, good call. Yeah, no thank need. Thank you. It's, yeah. I'm enjoying not studying. <laughs> Good, go easy yeah. on yourself. Calm the fuck down. It is nice. It is nice not having a deadline. <laughs> um, but I guess this I am hope stuff and the treading water has been a real passion project and that keeps me busy away from cricket and I love that. What I, I know what I want to do is help people. So I don't know in what capacity that will be, but it's along those lines and I think... Yeah, help people. I want to bring people together. And I quite like the idea of therapy through sport and music. I guess that's two things that have mm, have helped, helped me. Helped you, yeah. Well, that's cool. Well, I mean, um, yeah, we've uh, touched upon the perfectionism thing. So whatever you do, I'm sure you're going to do, do it very, very well <laughs> <laughs> and challenge yourself and be hard on yourself. <laughs> and you, know, you mentioned you want to, your, your sister in her speech talking about having kids and you want your kids to play together. You, you do want a family? Yeah. How are you gonna, how funny. You, how, this is the hard thing. I, yeah. I touched upon this with Susie Bates. How, like, it, it's problematic, isn't it? How do you fit it in? Yeah, well, I think... You take a year off, maybe, at some Yeah, point? take a year off. It's been awesome seeing other female athletes do it. Yeah. Like, Amy Southwaite did it for the White Fins and came back, and I've seen other people do, do it. You know, there's a Aussie women's footballer I know, I think. She came back after after giving birth, so it's possible, and I think that's the great thing, that it's, that it's possible. But I, for me, like I talk about, I knew I wanted to be a White Fin when I was about nine, I think something I've always known is that I want my own family. And that's because family, to me, is everything because of the family I've grown up in. And mm. So, yeah, I don't know. I would definitely – I'll put i put my family first before cricket. So whether that means retiring earlier or taking a break, I know for me, you know, cricket's this short period of time, but family's forever. Mm. Well, when you see like your um, your friends slash idols like um, Susie and Sophie, who are in their like, mid to late thirties and they're still fucking kicking ass, mm. you must think, well, I'm only twenty two. I could take a year off, two years off, and I've still got ages to go. Yeah, I mean, I want to play cricket for as long as I can, as much as I enjoy it, and I think you know, I love being competitive. I love getting better each day, and that's what professional sport allows you to do. Um, but yeah. People have taken breaks and come back and come back stronger. So, yeah, I mean, who knows what will happen in the future. But, mm. yeah, I definitely, definitely want to have a family of my own one day. But no time soon. I'm too young for that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, oh, so your partner, you've been together like a year and a year and a bit? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. How did, like, that must be hard to make that work. Like, you're, we're meeting in um, Mount Monganui today, and you're off to the U. Where are you going next? South Africa. South Africa. Like, how many, how many weeks a year are you at home? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it changes each year, but um, now he's a cricketer himself, and 
with the Wellington Firebird. So he gets it, and um, I think that's the the main thing. And c- communicating well as well, I guess, mm. is important because when you're away, that's the you know that's the only way you can talk to each other. Yeah. So you have to communicate. Um, but yeah, it's just valuing the time you have with each other as well, and un- understanding it. Like we're both young, you want to go both do do what you love and and have someone that supports that and I think for us we're both lucky that we get it yeah um but yeah I mean it's definitely gonna be be it'll probably just get harder because there's going to be more cricket but I guess you know if you want it to work you find a way and you make it work yeah absolutely if it's meant to be it'll yeah it'll figure its way out but yeah it does make it tough yeah definitely yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, yes, yes. Susie had um, some sort of um, theory, which I'd never sort of thought of. She said there's a lot of like same sex relationships in uh, women's cricket, and she she puts that down to the fact that um, you're away so yeah. much. You spend so, so it's just a convenient yeah. sort of thing in a way. Yeah, which is an interesting and take. And it's 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 accepted as well, yeah. and in that environment, and mm. yeah, you spend a lot of time with those people. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, yeah, you find a way to make it work and. Mm. And hopefully your travel can, you know, if you're playing cricket in the same country at the same time, it, it can work and, and whatnot. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, how good. Hey, well, that's probably a good place to wrap it up. Unless there's anything that um, I haven't brought, brought, brought up or touched upon that you want to? No, happy. Happy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you uh, for being so generous with your time. We've been going for almost two hours and I, I can't thank you enough. <laughs> your your poor um, teammates who you're know, rooming with. I them out. Kick them out. Shit. What, where where yeah. have they been for the last two hours? <laughs> Someone else is very well. Yeah, maybe I have to buy them dinner or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Mealy Kerr, thank you so much for your time. You're a great New Zealander and, um, yeah, I... I, I, yeah, I'm just I'm actually humbled to be in your in your presence. Like the Thank stuff that you. you're doing outside of cricket is just phenomenal, and it's um, changing lives and saving lives. Thank you, Dom. No, I appreciate and appreciate all you do. I, like your podcast channel is amazing, and um, you've allowed people to open up with you, and that's that's a credit to you when you get people to open up. So it's it's been great to chat and to finally meet you in person (laughs) finally (laughs) I appreciate it you're the best